A new frontier in human progress is here, one where people can choose to live in balance with the planet. But no country has achieved this yet. As things stand, human activity is putting immense pressure on the planet, leading to crises like COVID-19, climate change, and mass extinctions. Business as usual is not an option. Transformation is possible, but inequalities stand in the way of solutions. Now is the time for all countries, rich and poor, to redesign their paths to human progress. It is vital to work with and not against nature, to scrap harmful subsidies and incentivize greener regulation, and relearn how to value the natural world, changing our consumption patterns in the process. This is a new planetary era, one where human activities are shaping life on Earth. It is our choice to use our power to restore, rethink, and transform. We are the first generation of the Anthropocene, let us be the first to choose the legacy of people and planet thriving together. Welcome everybody to this Anthropocene to start off with, and also to the <clears throat> presentation of the new Human Development Report, the 2020 version, which focuses on human development and the age of the Anthropocene. It's also the 30th anniversary of this uh, report that was started in 1990 by UNDP to look beyond income, to look beyond GDP, uh, to understand human development. And so we're very happy that UNDP and the Belgian government together have decided to do this presentation of this enormously important report today. We have uh, four eminent speakers to be with us and to give us a better insight in Sorry, what the report is about and also what the relevance of the report will be. We have Minister who is the uh, responsible minister in the Belgian government for development cooperation and also responsible for major cities. We have UNDP administrator Achim Steiner with us with as we have Yes. Also, Pedro Cortesao, Pedro is the Director the of the Human Development Office, Office within UNDP. UNDP. And we have and also we have Professor Tanya Wittenkopf, who is an associate, associate professor at the University of Leuven, of Leuven for, uh, for uh, environmental, environmental or for sustainability for politics. So thank you very much, all four of you, to be with us and the hundreds of people who are also joining us for this presentation. We have a full house, I would say, and that's a good sign that people understand the importance of, uh, of this report and of the issues at hand. But let me first ask Minister Kitir, Kitir to, do the, to do the opening statement for this uh, for presentation, this, uh, presentation as she is the host of our presentation today. Minister Kitir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you to UNDP for the introductory video, which immediately sets the scenes. Dear all, even if today we are again meeting behind the screen, and even if I, just like you, would have loved to have seen that differently, I am extreme, extremely proud to make this intervention. A lot of you joined us today. That not only makes me happy, but it also makes shows the enormous interest in the Human Development Report 2020. It has been almost a year since the COVID pandemic intruded into our lives. We have forgotten the meaning of business as usual. This year's Human Development Report makes that abundantly clear. Just have a look at the chart in the report that pictures the evolution of human development over the past 20 years. COVID-19 undid the progress of the last decade. It pushed some 100 million people back to extremely poverty. The pandemic also demonstrated how much the world is interconnected, that folding back on ourselves 
does not help at all. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not true when we are talking about the fight against this virus. It is also true when discussing our general well-being, our progress as a humankind and the well-being of our planet. Economic growth has long been one of the primary objectives of policymaking. But what is economic growth? What is it more than the increase of what we as a nation produce every year in goods and services? It does not tell us anything about the quality of the air we breathe, nor does it guarantee our kids quality education or parents affordable health care. Maybe we have been blinded by it for too long. Maybe it is time to look at growth from another angle. Muted. Kate Roard puts it brilliantly. Growth is about seeing our children grow, seeing nature grow in spring. And it is also about us understanding that when something tries to grow forever, within a healthy living thriving system, it is a threat to the health of the world. A new generation of economics, many of them female, have started thinking differently about how we should approach economic theory. It makes me hopeful that the students of the KU Leuven have proposed Robert for an honorary doctorate this year. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what the Human Development Report has been repeating for the past three decades. The report revolutionized our understanding of human development away from a narrow focus on the GDP growth. It measures growth, it measures prog progress by integrating life expectations, access to education, and now in this third 30s edition, highlighting the pressure we are putting on our planet Earth. The time has come when the damaging consequences become clear of how we people act, of how we people behave, of whom we people have actually become throughout the past century, the fall of our own survival. But this is also the time for us to realize how we need to change. The message, the message each report over the past 30 years have confided is the following. We need to change this together. We are all in this together. Because, because what is the use of having high score on health, on education and living, living standards, when environmental, environmental degradation is threatening all we have achieved, here or somewhere else in the world, for this generation or the next? In this age, more than ever, we will be judged on our common global achievements. Being rich as a country does no longer being equal to being successful. Our development as humans depends on what we people are able to achieve jointly. For my own part, I have launched a process for two new programs, thematic programs. I want these new initiatives to face challenges that cross borders, a new program to help people in the Sahel fight desertification, and another program in Central, Central Africa to strengthen decent work and social protection mechanism. The challenges are enormous. International ambition is to restore 100 million hectares of degraded land by 2030 in the Sahel. And low-income countries need an additional $78 billion to close the financing gap for their social protection system. We cannot solve this by ourselves, but let us do it. Let, let us do our part. First on Central Africa. During this pandemic, we in Belgium have all been able to revalue the importance of our own social protection system, allowing for access to good quality health care systems and to unemployment benefits. In the global south, they do not have that luxury. That is why we want to allocate funds to assist our partner countries in that region, to ensure that the people who need it most get access to healthcare and unemployment benefits. We need to stop this trend. 
We need to stop people falling back into extremely poverty. We need to safeguard our human development. And secondly, the Sahel. The climate crisis is a challenge of our generation. The least developed countries in the global south risk bearing, bearing the worst consequence. The Sahel region is one of the most affected regions. It borders the Sahel. It has many more problems. The report is clear. Climate change will have a huge impact on inequality and extremely poverty. With a new program, we want to take part in the fight against the expanding deserts and break the cycle of poverty. For the farmers and herders facing difficulty on deplied grasslands, for the men and women struggling to feed their families. Ladies and gentlemen, to me, the fight against climate change is a fight for social, for social justice. But for our fight to succeed, succeed, our struggle against climate change should also reflect social fairness. Thanks to a worldwide climate generation, a social climate generation that is, awareness has been growing. They have made sure we all face the facts. They point at us to not stay put. They are asking us to take up our responsibility now. And what they are asking is what the third report, the thirtieth report is asking. And it is that we do not choose between people or trees. It is that we choose for a common future with all 200 countries on the ranking. Again, we are all in this together. International solidarity is the only way to turn this age of humans into a success. And the good news is we know what we have to do. We know how we have to do it and we know when we have to do it. And that is today rather than tomorrow. Thank you very much. And over to Guy. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Kittir, for this uh, very clear message about the report and about the challenges that we face. Let me quickly ask you uh, if there is, when you read the report, if there was like one figure that struck you most and that you would like to highlight uh, and to give to the audience as something to reflect on? Um, the report struck me in many ways, but if I have to choose one thing, I would choose, uh, I would choose the weather. Because uh, in Belgium, we like to, compl to complain about the weather, but actually we don't have to complain. Because if we do not change the climate uh, challenge of the climate disaster, in 80 years, that means that the poorest country, they will experience 100 extra, extra days of extreme weather, while the rich countries at the same time will experience the days of extremely weather go down. So, and even if we um, full implemented the Paris Agreement, we can only cut the number of extra days in a half. In the, in a half. And that is striking. That is striking yeah. because that means in any case, it is always the poorest people who will carry the most burden of the situation. And that's, that strengthened me in my plan, in my plan to, to focus on the, on, the, on the least developed countries and that we have to make of climate financing a priority. Yeah, we'll come back to those uh, least developed countries later uh, this evening. And let me, before we, we shift to, uh, to Achim Steiner, the UNDP administrator, let me uh, tell the audience that there is a Q&A box on your uh, screen. You can use that to communicate the questions that you have. And we have a team of uh, people at the Human Development Office that will follow up those questions, try to answer them in the box. And we will also take from them for the last part of this prep of, of this presentation uh, when we will put some of your questions to the panel. So I forgot to say that in the, in the beginning. Please put your questions in the Q and A box, and everything that you hear that you think is really something important uh, or that should be shared with an even larger public, you can always tweet with the hashtag HDR2020, so please do so. But let me now ask uh, UNDP Administrator Achim Steiner to give his 
take on this seminal report that we are looking at and that we are presenting today. Dr. Steiner, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Guy, and thank you also, Minister Kittier, for your um, inspiring introduction just now. I think this is um, the framing that you provided uh, for the launch or the presentation of today's uh, Human Development Report is precisely the backdrop against which I think we are all right now struggling to figure out what next. And um, you know what a long and dark year this has been. Um, a tiny virus has humbled the human race, threatening and in fact delivering a reversal of decades of development, as you already pointed out. And I think it is against this backdrop that um, in UNDP last year, the Human Development Report team asked itself the question, should we just publish another human development report or has the time come to really embrace this challenge that the future of human development in, is inextricably linked to both um, the impact that human development has on our planet and how our planet will either enable or preclude human development to progress. We have discussed this, we have transacted it, concepts such as sustainable development have taught us a lot. And yet the Human Development Index, so many of the metrics um, that have been used traditionally to measure human development are narrow. They exclude too many dimensions and above all, they have never been able to really bring together human success as a, as a historical development pathway and the state of our planet. Just imagine for a moment that we now live in an age, and I want to begin with this notion of the Anthropocene, where the total mass of things humans have made, buildings, roads, bottle tops, now exceeds the total mass of all living things on the planet, from tiny bacteria to giant whales to um, bees to trees and forests. That is an extraordinary thing to realize. And at the same time, we also know from science that in just a hundred years we managed to, with the emission of ozone depleting substances, burn a hole in the ozone layer. That tiny film around our planet that actually enables life to thrive as we know it. We have put um, a footprint of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere that is now altering the climate on the planet. We are impacting on the biosphere, uh, the loss of species, the loss of arable land, the conversion of nature into essentially development has been in one sense an extraordinary success story, in another sense an unfolding tragedy that we're just beginning to really realize how its dimensions will affect the future. And so we chose this emerging notion of um, living in an age of the Anthropocene, which really emerges out of geology and um, this understanding that um, these geological epochs define things that essentially geologists can trace a thousand years later um, in, uh, in the history of the planet, so to speak. And the concept emerged, interesting enough, from a group of scientists, including Paul Knudsen, who was the Nobel Prize winning scientist who was at the forefront of understanding that um, ozone depleting substances were in fact burning a hole into our atmosphere, into our ozone layer. And his sense was is that the notion of the Anthropocene is both a science-based, empirically founded way of explaining how significant the impact of humans now is on the planet, literally changing atmosphere, changing biosphere, and in that sense, it is a new age. It requires us to embrace a different consciousness of quite how consequential seven and a half billion decisions about what we eat, what we consume, how we produce, will have not only on the planet today, but in fact for hundreds of generations to come. And yet to some, the Anthropocene could be a very dystopian view of the future. And that is certainly not Paul Knudsen's intention, and it is certainly not the way in which UNDP interprets the embracing of this concept, because with it comes also the realization that we have unprecedented knowledge, capacity, science, technology, wealth in monetary terms, unprecedented in history, which allows us to make different choices. And Minister, you spoke to it towards the end of your remarks just now that 
it is about how we choose to do things differently. And that this notion that we need to trade off human well-being against environmental sustainability really is a 20th century, very narrow and entrapping concept. Trading off people against nature or vice versa for that matter, which is very much what you also spoke to. This is not about one against the other, but the whole report that um, has taken this approach to defining this as the next frontier is precisely the ability of human beings to thrive on this planet in the 21st century with soon eight, nine billion people and not destroy the foundations of life. And it is in these different choices that we believe we are able to truly make that shift that we have already discussed for years, that we sense, and that is not just one of environment, it is also one of justice, of inequality, of societies sensing that the choices we have made and are continuously being asked to make are actually increasingly unjustifiable, not rational, unjust, unfair. And that is also why the world is, in a political sense, in turmoil, on top of trying to manage an um, extraordinary moment in time with the pandemic, and is now asking deep questions about the kind of recovery. And so in this year's report, and this is the second point, and Pedro will speak to that in a moment, we make a methodological leap forward of the same quality that I believe led Professor Amatya Sen and Mahbub al Haq 30 years ago to challenge head on the measurement of human progress in just GDP, gross domestic product terms, by expanding the human development indicator into reflecting education and health. That notion that development is about freedom, opportunity, capacity, and not about whether you are rich or poor. And so in the year 2020, we took the next leap forward and we introduced the Planetary Adjusted Human Development Index, which adds into one index two parameters, carbon emissions and material consumption. Data that is available for most countries that allows us legitimately to correlate that set of indicators that measures human well-being and progress with the immediate interaction with planetary uh, well-being. And out of that arises an as yet experimental index. We were very deliberate about it, but in the way that it is being welcomed and embraced as a step forward, not just for statisticians, development professionals, no, for people, our citizens in every country across the world are currently having to confront choices about how to recover from COVID-19, but also how to look at the future of development in a different way. And so the index, I think, allows us both as data-rich um, analysts, a different way of capturing reality, and secondly, it empowers a public debate that is all about choices. And that's why, and I end with that, there are three major areas that the report identifies in which this shift, not only in thinking and understanding, but in action, in choosing, will happen. Social norms. If people do not share a set of norms, for instance, how much inequality is justifiable in our societies? We have lived through some very turbulent years where basically markets were seen as the only yardstick of success and you know, inequality, environmental damage, well, that's the price of progress. You know, We'll fix it as we go along. Well, we live in the 21st century. That kind of normative choice is highly contested today. Unfairness, injustice. So social norms become fundamental to being able to work with this understanding of living in the age of the Anthropocene and the kind of choices we need to make. Secondly, incentives. Our economies are still so highly distorted. Fossil fuel subsidies, um, not only in the hundreds of billions, but actually causing damage in the trillions, according to the IMF, and yet we are spending them even now in the midst of this crisis in the stabilization and stimulus packages we are still trying to stabilize, and perhaps in the short term, it's inevitable. The economy increasingly of yesterday at the expense of actually accelerating the emergence of the economy of tomorrow, be it in the energy, in the transport sector, in agriculture. So we need to tackle these incentives that not only distort markets, they paralyze our economies, our societies in a status quo that is increasingly threatening to what comes next. And finally, we need to work with nature. We need to invest in nature. This notion that humanity, with all the technology and science,
can somehow become independent of nature in the 21st century. Maybe the most tragic um, hype assumption of the last century. We are highly dependent on nature. Our economies, our well-being, our future are predicated on being able to maintain nature and all the ecological infrastructure on our planet. And that extractive one or two centuries of rapid development by essentially saying nature is a free commodity and it allows us to get to the next level of development and from there on we will try to fix things, it simply does not hold anymore. So I end by saying that in the way that we have tried to shape the discussion this year about the very real moment in time of COVID-19 and the pandemic, but very much with that appreciation that in every society right now, people are debating what is the way forward. It cannot be to go back to where we were. But how does this become empirically validated? How do we understand the consequences of policy choices? Where are the possibilities to act? And this is what brings us, Minister, um, you and I and our teams together today in, in presenting this report together. Because in your policy statement, you have also reflected Belgium's outlook on the future of development of development cooperation. And I believe in the way that UNDP is trying to provide thought leadership into this arena is very much aligned with where you see also Belgium's priorities. The development aid age is essentially over. We are investing in partnerships, both to still address inequalities, but also to enhance the capacity to act together collectively, be it in the Sahel, be it in Latin America, be it in Asia. It is in the 170 countries in which UNDP works today that we see the promise of cooperation through the lens of the future of development truly taking shape in another age. Thank you so much and give back to you. Thank you, Achim, uh, for this uh, presentation and, and uh, the highlights that you took from, from the report and, and the whole effort uh, behind it. Uh, you stressed the importance, of course, of choice for, uh, for development uh, as a core uh, concept within the human development approach. Now, we know that we live in a very un just or an unequal world and the minister already uh, referred to uh, to her work with least developed countries now can you very briefly give us an idea of how these poorest countries can really make a choice for a sustainable development within the unjust or unequal world that they work in I think one reason why the Human Development Report has developed such a large following, particularly in the developing world, in LDCs as they are classified in developing countries, is that um, they contribute to enabling countries to make more informed choices. You know, much of the early era of development aid was essentially transacting models. You know, developing countries were expected, advised, um, supported in following a particular model rather than being able to define the kind of development path that they would like to pursue in terms of their reality, social, environmental, economic realities. And the Human Development Board is a very powerful vehicle because over the 30 years, over 800 HDRs have been produced also at national level. It is almost like a franchise. Let's take that global framework and then apply it to our own national development. And I think it is, in one sense, an expression of the emancipation of developing nations to determine their own pathway and then define the terms for partnership. And I end by just giving you a very simple illustration. Uh, Minister Gatia spoke about the Sahel region. Let us look at the, the linkage between energy, climate change, poverty and development. 600 million people on the African continent do not have electricity today. There is over a billion people there and by 2050 there will be 2 billion citizens across Africa. That means 1.6 billion people will join the global electricity matrix between now and somewhere in 2050. Imagine if we were to pursue the 20th century pathway of electrification and production of electricity in a fossil fuel based economy. First of all, it would take far longer because in many African countries still today that electricity infrastructure has not been built. 
Secondly, we would have an emissions footprint that would be prohibitive in terms of the Paris Agreement, and climate change would literally um, explode out of control. And we would miss an opportunity to use renewable energy right now, off-grid, on-grid, as an accelerator of development, to address poverty, to stimulate the kind of economic progress that we want to see in the Sahel and increasingly across um, the whole developing world, because without it, um, we will not succeed. And the vaccine has just been a brutal reminder, the International Chamber of Commerce just said, if you think that you can stop the pandemic by just vaccinating people in the rich countries, you are making a tragic mistake. And it is precisely these moments in history that require clarity of thinking, good analysis and data, and above all, the feeling that you're not being told what to do, but that you're being supported in choosing what you do next. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarification. And that brings us straight into the heart of the data and of the knowledge that is being uh, assembled in the Human Development Report. And there's really nobody better uh, to explain the, the details and, and the deep insights of the report than Pedro Concesao, who is the Administrator Ahim Steiner uh, and Katia, um, and uh, I think the most part, most important part of the discussion of, of today is going to be the discussion. So I'll try to be brief, also because um, a lot has already been said about the report. So you'll hear me reiterate some of the points uh, already made. But I would start by uh, emphasizing uh, the central message of the report which is that it invites us to look at challenges such as COVID-19 and, and climate change uh, really as reflections of an unprecedented moment uh, in our history and in the history of our planet, rather than as separate problems that need to be solved with different uh, and separate pathways. Uh, and as we've heard, this is a moment where human pressures on the planet are driving dangerous planetary change, dangerous because it's harming us, as humans, uh, but also all life on the planet. Uh, this is a, an unprecedented moment that has been described uh, as a, a new geological epoch of the Anthropocene, as, as we've heard. And I would like to emphasize that it is characterized uh, in many ways, but uh, uh, importantly, by the emergence of an unprecedented set of risks of our own making, uh, of which COVID-19 uh, could be an example. Um, it's very likely that the virus jumped from animals to humans, uh, and we do know that the frequency of this type of diseases, zoonotic diseases, has increased, and we also know that it has uh, increased as a result of the planetary pressures uh, uh, that are driving uh, dangerous changes to ourselves and to all forms of life. So having reiterated the central message of the report, let me uh, uh, briefly elaborate on, uh, on three key uh, points. First, the challenge, uh, secondly, the goal, and then thirdly, uh, uh, the way forward. Now, the challenge is uh, that we are not only facing uh, an unprecedented set of, of risks, uh, the risks that I uh, just mentioned, but that when these risks materialize in shocks, they are superimposed on a world with very large and growing inequalities. We just uh, heard about the, uh, uh, the differences across countries. Uh, but these inequalities are actually exacerbated uh, uh, by these shocks. Uh, let me take uh, COVID-19 as an, as an example. Uh, we do know that the economic impact um, has been worse for women than for men uh, because there are more women uh, in some of the economic sectors more affected than men. Uh, but also because some of the social norms about the role of women uh, in homework or childcare are reasserting themselves. So many women around the world are uh, pulling back from the labor force. Uh, uh, our report documents drops uh, of as much as 10 percentage points in the labor force participation of women in many countries. And this represents a reversal of, of progress uh, that had taken um, uh, decades to achieve. But actually, this pattern of shocks uh, interacting with inequality holds uh, more broadly. So uh, if we take a look at these numbers, 
uh, they show that the countries that face more ecological threats, uh, droughts, floods, storms, are those also where gender inequality is higher. So this is the graph to the left of your slide. Um, but uh, inequalities, the, the, the graph to the right shows that inequalities in human development more broadly, so not only gender inequalities, but in human development more broadly, also reflect the same pattern, where you see uh, uh, higher levels of ecological threats linked to higher levels of inequality. Inequalities are also uh, linked to dangerous planetary change, uh, and uh, this relates to the asymmetries in consumption and in power uh, between those that uh, over-extract and over-pollute and those bearing the consequences. And Minister Kitir has already uh, spoken to this point and in fact uh, alluded to the numbers that you see uh, on the slide where um, uh, the uh, red lines show uh, uh, the increase uh, in number of days per year of extreme temperature uh, by the end of the century and you see that in low uh, human development countries this could be this could increase by 100 uh, and as minister Katira already indicated actually in uh, very high human development countries you would actually see a reduction in the days of extreme uh, heat by uh, 18 days a year but the blue lines show that uh, this pattern uh, is not uh, inevitable and it's a matter of choice. So the blue lines represent what would happen were we uh, to uh, reduce greenhouse gases emissions in line with the uh, uh, Paris uh, Agreement. So um, the number of extreme days in uh, low uh, human development countries uh, could be uh, uh, cut by half. So uh, this is the, uh, uh, the key message. The second key message uh, is that the, the way in which we frame choices matter. And the report emphasizes uh, the idea that it's important to uh, bring our embeddedness in nature forward to the core uh, so that the goal of advancing human development, which remains vital, uh, is supplemented uh, uh, with uh, uh, the idea that it's important to is uh, also uh, uh, planetary pressures. Uh, because if we don't do that, the very notion of human development for many today, and perhaps for everyone in the future, uh, will be foreclosed. So uh, I'll, I'll move now to the second point, which has to do with the, with the goals. Uh, and uh, um, uh, our administrator has already alluded to uh, this proposal that the report makes of looking uh, at advancing human development, in this graph it's represented by the Human Development Index on the horizontal uh, axis, um, while at the same time looking at what's happening in terms of planetary pressures with a new index of planetary pressures that combines material footprint and um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, which is represented on the, on the vertical axis. So what the, uh, the, this uh, sh uh, chart shows uh, is that uh, the aspirational space, the destination for human development, is that uh, green triangle uh, at the bottom right-hand corner uh, of this graph. Uh, and what's significant is that this graph gives us not only a sense of the direction uh, of development, but also shows uh, that we, uh, as we plot countries on, on these two dimensions, which uh, you see in the blue dots in the chart, we uh, quickly realize that this is a space, this aspirational destination is a space that is currently not occupied by any country. So um, uh, the objective, uh, therefore, we suggest uh, is to um, uh, advance uh, uh, human development uh, while easing uh, planetary pressures to move towards that uh, new aspirational space. Now, advancing human development uh, is not only about people's well-being. Uh, I think that often the concept of human development, perhaps uh, because of the way in which the Human Development Index was constructed, is associated with the notion of, of, of uh, well-being, which is central to the concept of human development. But it's also, human development is also about agency, uh, about giving people uh, the ability to make choices. Uh, and this brings me to, to the last point uh, on the way forward. Uh, and the report lays out uh, three mechanisms of change that uh, uh, our administrator has already described uh, to enable and encourage people uh, to make different choices. 
so let me just uh, go back to them very briefly. First, uh, social norms, uh, and we see that social norms uh, can change quite quickly. We see how quickly we've changed uh, what's expected of us when it comes to things like using masks or smoking in shared spaces. Uh, and we therefore must now seek to establish norms that give greater, greater weight to uh, this aspiration of easing planetary pressures. Second, prices and regulation, um, uh, which can change uh, completely economic incentives on what is consumed, produced, perhaps more important, what kind of investments are made. Uh, and here to what the administrator has already said, I would add the importance of um, the signals that prices can give towards investments on research, innovation and technology. Uh, and then finally, um, looking at nature not, not, not as a constraint, but as a, a actually a, an opportunity, a partner, a collaborator uh, in advancing human development as we protect and restore ecosystems. Um, and a very clear example here includes, for instance, investments that can be made in restoring uh, ocean ecosystems, the, the blue economy, which can provide uh, huge economic opportunities uh, and uh, ways of, of advancing human development. Now, let me conclude by saying that um, uh, a barrier or standing in the way of um, uh, moving in this direction are, uh, I come back to this idea of inequality, the significant imbalances in power and voice. Uh, uh, I will uh, just give an example uh, that we um, uh, put forward in, in the report. Um, our estimates suggest that the contribution of indigenous peoples uh, on a per person basi basis to manage uh, forests uh, that we all know can work as carbon sinks uh, is roughly equivalent to the carbon dioxide emissions per person of the top 1% of the global income distribution. So you see the huge asymmetry in contributions to planetary pressures uh, and the contributions of those that are actually trying to uh, safeguards uh, and restore and preserve some of the ecosystems that are uh, so relevant to uh, help us to mitigate climate change. And these indigenous peoples are the very people that are often marginalized, uh, if not persecuted, uh, around the world. So um, to conclude, these inequalities are actually putting people and planet on a, on a collision course, but uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we can make different choices. Uh, and our aspiration is simply that with this report, uh, we'll help to uh, put forward some signposts to continue to advance human development while easing planetary pressures. I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion today. Thank you. Inviting us to read the whole report and, and look at the data ourselves. And one of the, the aspects that, uh, that the, the administrator already touched upon and, and that you also mentioned, of course, is the, the measurement of development and, uh, <clears throat> Maybe instead of asking you to, to give us an extra uh, insight into this uh, new um, index of which uh, Achim Steiner has already spoken, I'll, I'll skip uh, a question that I had because I'm looking at, uh, at the clock and, and go straight to, uh, to Katja Biedenkopf, uh, who as a, a professor in, uh, in sustainability politics is very much aware of the importance of how you measure uh, environmental uh, degradation, but also um, the, the positive effects and the developmental uh, effects of, uh, of politics of policies. So I would like to ask uh, Katja to give us her uh, assessment of this new uh, planetary uh, pressures adjusted human development index to give us an, how her appreciation, but also try to make us understand what is the importance of such a measurement uh, instrument and how do we learn from it? Katja, if you would be willing to give us your idea about uh, this new measurement index, please. Because he said that UNDP wants to be uh, provide thought leadership. And I think that probably really is um, one of the strengths that I see with this new index, with this planetary adjusted human development index. Um, 
And I think in some way it's the logical consequence of the sustainable development goals uh, that we have adopted uh, a few years ago and the growing recognition among policymakers and others that a healthy ecological system is the basis for th a thriving social system and uh, that then in turn is very important for a good economic system. And that very much links to this um, conception of a strong sustainability. And we're not there yet in a sense that everyone recognizes such a conceptualization which in the end is a hierarchy and really places uh, the ecological system at the bottom and, and at the source of our human and also economic well-being. So um, in that sense, the thought leadership and trying to change our conceptualization of um, where we should thrive, uh, sorry, where we should strive to go uh, and uh, how we should organize our societies is to me um, very important. And maybe if I may just, sorry, yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to point to, to a second point that um, I think is very important on links to Minister Kittir's uh, portfolio and also her uh, intervention in the beginning of this webinar, and that's the link to development cooperation. And um, Dr. Steiner mentioned the partnership among countries. It's really not um, about us helping or being benevolent towards any countries, but taking in the footprint that we have and the damage that we cause in other countries is another very important recognition um, that, that I would like to highlight. So it emphasizes our responsibility for causing certain environmentally damaging activities outside our borders, outside of Belgium. And um, that concept of the put footprint really highlights that collaboration with and support for low income countries really is important for their environmental and social conditions, but it is also us taking our responsibility for the consequences of our own action. Um, and, and I think that's another aspect that I'd like to highlight um, and that really comes out very clearly from this report. One of the things that, uh, that we also notice when we read the report and look at these at the index is that the position of a country like Belgium, for instance, changes slightly. Some countries actually uh, change their rating very dramatically, but Belgium changes or shifts from the 18th position in the Human Development Index to the 14th uh, position in the uh, Planetary Pressures Adjusted Index. How important is that and, and what do we learn from that? The first lesson I would learn from that is that others perform even worse than we do. So I don't <laughs> think it's necessarily a reason to pat ourselves on our shoulders and think we're performing so well. Um, but others' footprint is just higher and that's what bumps us up a few uh, places in, in that uh, index. So it's, no. yeah, I think yeah, maybe I'll leave it there. Okay, we'll come back to you uh, later with some, some questions, but let me now go back to Minister Kitir for, uh, for an additional question because uh, Katja Bidinkov already uh, mentioned or returned to a theme that we, have already, that we touched upon before, the, 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 the strong impact of this extractive uh, developmental model, especially on the poorest countries. And you already, uh, Minister, gave a few examples of programs that you introduced uh, to, to and that are in line with the proposals or the points that the, that the report makes. But is there is there one thing extra that you think that uh, Belgian policy or Belgian policy in development cooperation should change in order to be more in line with this proposed Anthropocene-centered uh, human development? Thank you for your questions, um, for your question. Um, I, throughout my career, I, um, I always focused on, on equality. Uh, I want to, to speak up for those who, who do, do not have a voice and for those who, who do not have a seat at the table table and I have always uh, defended the most vulnerable 
and it is clear from the report that uh, inequality is reinforced. Uh, it is already said also in our country, unfortunately, unfortunately, is this the case? If you look at the pandemic, uh, uh, what the, how the effect of the pandemic had on schooling or on poverty. So Belgian development cooperations focus on the poorest countries. And I would like to continue uh, on that path uh, as Minister of Development Cooperation and uh, Urban Development. Uh, I believe that strengthen resilience of people is the key to empower them and to ensure that they can face those challenges. So the, for me, it's very important to strengthen the resilience of, of the people. But to do that, I cannot do that alone. I want to work with all the actors. I want to work with UNDP, of course, but also with uh, many civil society organizations we fund and uh, with our universities. So cooperation is, is the key uh, is the key to, to success. And I want to go back to the new programs that I have been spoken in my in my speech. Uh, we have first the, the climate change. I think that is a, pro, a program that that we aim to implement in the Sahel um, that will focus on the growing ch challenging of the des uh, desertification, um, fighting the expanding in the, the Sahara. And we are doing this to ensure that uh, the local farmers, um, that they can continue to raise crops uh, on their fields and to support their families uh, and communities. And the second one is the is the social protection. Um, if you see in Central Africa, we are looking to support decent work and to social work, protection of employees because can you imagine what the lockdown means uh, for a mother of four to sell vegetables on a market? And what if what if she cannot take out her shards? Um, how will she feed her kids? And it's very important. I think uh, we have to stand still by this by this question. And um, the ALO they estimated that more than uh, sixty six percent of the employees in the in the sub Sahara uh, of Africa is in informal sector. So I want to aim. Um, at getting more people, um, more people social coverage. So we need to, to formalize, formalize um, extensing uh, informal work, and this can contribute significantly to provide uh, to poverty redux reduction and to access uh, to basic services uh, such as um, healthcare. So, but I want to repeat: we cannot do this on our own. Uh, we are also counting on you, UNDP. You are our partner in core funding to make this happen. And together, together we can build we can build back better, fairer and greener. And I therefore look forward to seeing how you will integrate the findings of this report, report uh, both in your program and in, and in your strategic plan 2022 and uh, 2025. Okay, thank you very much, Minister, for, uh, for this clarification again and uh, for your uh, investment in the whole issue. Let me now go to, uh, to uh, Administrator Achim Steiner for uh, a last question to him uh, because the, the report is, is breaking new ground and that's clear. And at the same time, it's returning to a theme of environment that has been on the, on the horizon of UNDP and of uh, human development before. So, could you just briefly give us uh, again an idea of why environment and, and environmental uh, worries are so crucial to human development that we have to make it into the central theme of this human development? Okay, I, I would like to answer by saying we, we did not go back to an environmental dimension. What we try to do with this report is to connect a very human-centered view of development and everything that happens on this planet to a rapidly emerging science and empirical evidence that in the decisions we take, we are eroding the very foundations of life on the planet. And I think that it is in the fusion, it is in the hybrid nature of the new index that we um, try to bring together what too often have become disparate areas of action. Why are we on the streets protesting um, against each other as citizens over clean air? 
um, and you know, acting on climate change. Okay, maybe you may not believe the signs of climate change. Are you really in favor of highly polluted cities? Um, you know, seven million people die currently every year prematurely because of indoor and outdoor pollution. These are official statistics, and there are hundreds of thousands in Europe of those seven million, even today. That's the price um, we wanted to pay. Too much of this um, debate about environment versus human, it's jobs versus green, simply is irrelevant to the challenge of managing the future of development in the 21st century. And so I think what we have tried to do by bringing the notion of the Anthropocene in is to acknowledge that this, in, a, in many ways, is a human age and the age of humans, which is both an understanding of the significance of our actions, but also of the power to choose to act with information. And I think therein lies, to me, the extraordinary um, convergence of the world. Today, UNDP launched and published um, the largest ever poll, as we call it, undertaken on climate change. 1.2 million people across 50 countries who we polled using digital technology, gaming platforms on whether they think climate is an emergency or not. And, you know, the extraordinary thing is here we are in the year 2021 and 64% across the world agree. And just think back five years. That's what information, that's what education, that's what understanding helps us to um, come together as a world community and not argue that you are either for the environment or you're for people. Social justice, just transitions. Minister Kitir, you spoke to this. This is the currency of a successful economy people who trust their government. You don't have to be rich or poor to manage this pandemic very well or very badly. Um, obviously, it helps when you have funds, but the foundational currency of effective societies is trust, honesty, and informed decision-making. And this is at the core of UNDP's um, self-interpretation when it talks about governance. We work with countries on ensuring that governance functions well that transparency is there, that information is there. And you know, in that poll I just mentioned, um, we deliberately went out and said, how do we also poll young people? Too many voices in our decision-making are simply excluded. So we actually deliberately made the threshold 14 to 18 year olds part of the polling. And this is probably the, the most comprehensive polling of young people across many different countries, developed, developing, small island states, you know, massive countries uh, such as the US, um, ever been done because their voices are actually central to what happens next. And I think that is development understood in a different sense uh, when we talk as a minister of development and I as the head of the United Nations Development Program. We are in a very different age and this report uh, gives expression to that in both analysis and outlook. Thank you. Thank you very much, Achim, for uh, clarifying that uh, to us. I will throw one quick question to Pedro Concesao, and it's coming from André Huppin, who asks himself uh, or says, and I'll, I'll read, the Human Development Report makes almost no reference to the impact of demography on the planet's resources and does not mention the possible promotion of family planning as a means to reduce the impact, including on greenhouse gas emissions. Why is that? Pedro, you'll have to be brief, but please, can you give an answer to that question? Uh, in fact, uh, the report does look at uh, uh, demographic changes and uh, the decline in fertility rates and uh, projections uh, of the evolution of, of the population. And what we emphasize as we do the analysis and, and look at the evidence, uh, is uh, uh, the importance of, once again, uh, social norms in shaping uh, fertility decisions. So uh, even in countries where there has been equal level of access to education or services, the most important determinant on fertility decisions is actually what people in the community decide to do. Uh, so we take the analysis, the interpretation we make of uh, demographic dynam uh, dynamics as a, a further validation of this central notion of human development, that it's about agency, uh, it's about uh, uh, conceiving of development as freedom, it's about uh, uh, looking at uh, people uh, as agents, as uh, being able to make different choices and, and making different decisions. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. And I'm afraid that the clock dictates that we should start wrapping up uh, this presentation already. Let me ask first Katja Bidinkov to give her final word, uh, 30 second uh, point that she wants to make after reading the report. Uh, thank you, that's not much time. I would say it gives me hope, or I do really do hope that the planetary adjusted human development index will contribute to the recognition that we need more policy coherence, that we need to work across the policy areas and of course also across national boundaries. And I really hope that this thought leadership uh, will be a promise that will be, will, um, be reality. Thank you. Pedro, for you, the same question uh, as, as one of the authors of the report, one 30-second uh, point that you will still want to make for this audience. Uh, I would emphasize once again th this idea that we uh, can make um, uh, different choices, uh, that the institutions uh, that we've created are of our own making, uh, behavior, uh, what we buy, what we choose to invest, are choices that we make. We cannot change the laws of physics uh, and what um, our planet, as it changes, is telling us uh, is that we are entering into dangerous territory. Uh, so the planet will be fine, uh, but we might not be. So it's time for us to uh, uh, look at how to advance human development while using planetary pressures. Thank you. And then I'll ask the two hosts to wrap up uh, this session. Let me begin with Dr. Achim Steiner as the administrator of UNDP and responsible uh, for production of this human development report. Dr. Steiner, what is your final statement? Well, in 30 seconds, I, I was just trying to think, how can I best capture the moment? And, you know, I recently recorded a TED talk, which also puts this premium on being very brief and precise. and. I think at the heart of what we are grappling with in the midst of this pandemic is we need a systemic change. We need shifts that are deeper, fundamental um, around root causes. And, you know, at the end of the day, though, it's extremely important that we realize who actually changes systems. Systems don't change systems, as I said in that TED talk. It's people who change systems. And that is what is really at the heart of, of um, producing such a report that at first sight is complex but actually it's all about empowering people to have the confidence and the information and the vision to change systems. And so Minister Ketir, we spoke a few months ago when you first assumed office, I'm truly grateful that you made today an occasion where we could come together and speak to, to an interested public and to our colleagues across the development landscape, because this is a moment of leadership, a moment of choices and a moment of priorities. And um, I thank you for the opportunity to do this together with you today. Thank you, Achim Steiner, for these closing words. And then it falls to the host of the of the event, of, uh, Minister Kitir, to have the final say. Minister Kitir, please. Thank you very much for this powerful and enriching hour. Um, look, there is on, there is one final message I want I would want to give. Rankings are useful; they measure progress of countries in this case, but let's not forget that behind those rankings are people, human beings, and empowering them is what it is about. Look, as many as you of you know by now, or maybe not, but I started my professional life in a factory, assembling cars. But there is more to a factory than just the amount of cars it produces or the profit it generates. There are employ employees working, working in it, and they matter. How the factory influences their lives matters. To assemble cars, one requires resources, materials. Those come from somewhere. The impact of the factory on the people living in those countries matters. The impact it has on the environment matters. The impact cars have on our society whether they run on petrol or electric, matters. And all the, those aspects matter. And I'm grateful to the Human Development Report team for trying to internalize all these connected, but often overlooked factors together 
in a comprehensive figure. Because as the lead author of the first human development report, Mahboud Ulhaq said in 1990, people, people are the real wealth of a nation. And today I would add, we and the amazing nature surrounding us are the wealth of our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Kitir, for these uh, closing words. This is uh, the end of the presentation of the Human Development Report 2020 with the title Development and the Anthropocene, the Next Frontier. So we invite everybody to really read the full report, to act on it, and to make sure that the future will be a future of human development in together with nature and in a perfect uh, understanding of nature as well. Thank you very much for being with us. And we hope that uh, you understood how important the report is. Thank you. <laughs>